y'all welcome back to my channel you know recently i was speaking to jason over at the founder of the day channel here on youtube and it occurred to me that i really need to do a video on the augusta voice of the shenandoah valley on the virginia frontier um but if i'm gonna do that i also really should just go ahead and explain the paxton voice of pennsylvania because these groups are very similar they have similar motivations and they're, they're kind of connected in their way and to keep this from being just like way too too long and just too much information thrown out at once, I'm going to split this into two videos. So this first one, I'm going to talk about the Paxton Boys of Pennsylvania. And really to understand either of these groups, you really need to understand the relationship uh, between the Native American tribes that lived, you know, along the frontier and these backcountry men themselves. Um, there's always... There seems to be like a delicate balance that, that these groups have in times of peace where they can kind of get along despite their differences and that it, you know, war will come, whether it's Indian War or an intercontinental war like um, the French and Indian War, for example. This kind of messes with their balance, but then after the fact, they kind of find a way to get along again for the most part. But often if we're trying to compare the behavior of these two groups, it's like comparing apples to oranges because their cultures are very, very different. Um, a lot of Native American behavior seems barbaric and cruel, but even though, you know, it kind of, it is, there was a reason for it. They used that cruelty to prevent larger scale war. They used it to, you know, make a small raid effective for what they needed to prevent a, a larger amount of bloodshed. Um, and you also need to understand that Indian chiefs, they didn't have the kind of power that some people may believe. Indian chiefs were more like wise advisors that could help with diplomacy, they could help with leading the tribe, but they couldn't force anyone in their tribe or their clan to obey them. That was not uh, the way that power worked in these native tribes. Um, so often we have these raids on the frontier and it's the younger warriors who feel like, you know, they're doing what they need to do and they're ignoring the advice of the rest of their tribe. So, you know, if we have a situation where the Cherokee attack or the Shawnee attack, um, you know, if that's just one or two raids in isolation, then it really doesn't reflect the attitudes of, you know, the tribe overall. Um, you know, so that's something we have to understand. And also... I don't really need to explain like the European side of things, I don't think, because, you know, that that way of kind of law and order and courts is what we still have to this day. But to this day, we also have, you know, debates over capital punishment and whether that's right or wrong or effective. And for the Native American tribes, their perspective was very different. They didn't agree with capital punishment or courts. Um, to them, you know, if someone was murdered, then the victim's kin could exact revenge or the grave could be covered with gifts to kind of make up for that loss. But you don't have a third party, you know, you, like you wouldn't have the chief of the tribe stepping in, you know, to see justice done because to them, that's not justice, that's tyranny. That's someone who doesn't have any role to play in the scenario, putting their nose in, and that's not okay. Um, so it's very different from the European perspective. And there's more than once in, you know, the colonial history where these tribes would step in and say, hey, no, even though that white man killed an Indian, I, we don't want you to hang him because that's just contrary to our culture and that doesn't make anything better. Um, you know, so this, it's a very different understanding of right and wrong and how things should be done. And... The Pennsylvanians, you know, to start with them, they had kind of a unique relationship with these tribes as opposed to other colonies. Because when Penn founded the colony, you know, there was going to be a large number of Quakers who were pacifists. They're not in a position to have, you know, like a militia and all these arms, you know, to protect everyone. So they need a good relationship with the Indian tribes. Um, you know, and it started off like that. And then there were just because they aspired to something good doesn't mean they were able to do it in practice. We have the walking purchase where Pennsylvania cheated the Delaware 
out of a very large tract of land, um, and the Iroquois basically enforced it and, and gave Delaware no choice but to accept the theft. Um, but, you know, overall, they had done pretty well compared to other colonies in terms of keeping the peace. The thing about the frontier, though, whether we're talking about Pennsylvania or Virginia, um, is that it's, it's the gentry who control a lot of what, what happens. You know, they control the local government. They have a role to play alongside royal Indian agents in, you know, figuring out treaties and, you know, different things relating to uh, relations between the Indians and the colonists. But the common people, you know, the poor worker class, they don't have any say in this. And yet they are on the frontier trying to find a way to make a living and to keep their families fed and alive and, you know, while having no control over it. And a lot of times they feel entitled to whatever land they can work. Um, that goes back to other cultural differences. Um, and they, they kind of, they chafe against the restrictions that they see the gentry placing on them. Not only does this include the treaties I mentioned, but there's also the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which prohibits further westward expansion, basically until the king says otherwise. Um, these prohibitions on expansion, this is the, the colonist version of tyranny. This is what they see as tyrannical. And it eventually plays a role in their decision to rebel and support the American Revolution. And something else to acknowledge, the settlers on the frontier, they didn't just face the difficulty of, you know, knowing that at any time the Native Americans could attack, you know. Maybe we're at peace with this one tribe, but maybe this other tribe wants to attack, or maybe a group of warriors decide, you know, they want to go raid. Um, but they also felt threatened by the Eastern elites, not just because these elites controlled things that the, the poor working class had no control over, but also because the settlers on the frontier, they had a very specific role, and they, were, they knew what that role was. And that role was to provide a buffer to keep the Eastern... Uh, settlements safe in case war broke out or in case there were raids. Um, you know, they're this buffer that keeps everyone safe other than the settlers themselves, who are often left to their own devices to try to defend themselves, even at the same time that they're providing protection to all the rest. Um, so this causes a, a good amount of, of bitterness and suspicion, and I think that uh, that is pretty understandable that they would feel that way. And in Pennsylvania, a group of colonists had become so upset by the situation and by the fact that according to some of these treaties, the colony was actually providing food for some of the Native American groups that were living among them, um, that this group decided to take justice in their own hands as they saw things. So on December 14th of 1763, over 50 men from the Pennsylvania frontier, uh, possibly as many as a hundred, they decide to attack the uh, Conestoga Indians, which is a small group that had chosen to live near like Lancaster, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, um, despite you know all the English settlements around. But because of all these settlements, there's no hunting ground. There's no way to support themselves in the traditional way. So you know, as part of the treaties, they did receive some provisions from the colony. Um, this is part of why they're such an easy target from this group, because, you know, here's a prime example of what's upsetting them. So, at the time of this attack, we're told by Benjamin Franklin, actually, that the group is comprised of only 20 people living there. Seven men, five women, and eight children. And at the time of the surprise attack, there were actually only three men, two women, and one young boy who were even at home to, to be attacked. Um... Now, I'm going to use the term butchered to describe this, and for a good reason. The 50-plus frontiersmen that attacked, they intentionally used all the cruel methods they could think of to kind of try to inflict the terror on these people that they perceived the Indians as having inflicted on the settlers. Um... The governor of Pennsylvania would actually call this attack a cruel and inhuman act. The message was clear. The frontiersmen would do whatever they needed to um, 
to kind of try to stop this English aid to the Indians and try to get the Indians out of their area. Benjamin Franklin referred to this group of colonists as, quote, Christian white savages, end quote. The 14 Conestoga Indians who survived because they weren't present during the attack, they were taken to the Lancaster jail or workhouse. And it wasn't because they were in trouble. It was because the officials in the colony thought that maybe by keeping them there, they could protect them and keep them safe. It didn't really go that way. So, on December 27th of 1763, another group, probably some of the same men, maybe some different ones, they attack the jail. They kill all 14 that had taken shelter there and they bury them in a mass grave. Attempts by the officials to try to arrest the murderers were unsuccessful. The rest of the population either agreed with these men or were so terrified that they didn't dare, you know, give up the information they knew about them. And, you know, even as I describe this group as being the result of, you know, the common people being unhappy with the gentry and unhappy with Indians, you know, I'm not saying that all of the common people took part in this or supported this not what I'm saying, but there was enough of them that these events were able to take place. And in the aftermath of these attacks, about 200 Christian Indians from Moravian mission towns were moved to Philadelphia uh, for other attempts to keep them safe because the officials knew that they were targets now. <sighs> the Paxton boys didn't take too kindly to that because now a group of about 250 of them march towards Philadelphia, and by this time, they're officially calling themselves the Paxton Boys. Um, what they anticipated doing once they got there, I don't know. I could only speculate, but they marched anyway. And by the way, Paxton is the name of a settlement that they were from. Um, it's by modern-day Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So the Paxton Boys, they marched towards Philadelphia, and they are met in Germantown by provincial militia even some Quakers that turned out to try to stop them. And at this point, it's February of 1764. What follows has been term termed a pamphlet war, with good reason. Because in return for, you know, dispersing and going home, the Paxton boys' demands are that a couple of them, you know, be able to remain and write a pamphlet explaining, you know, their complaints, basically, and present it to the Pennsylvania Assembly. So they remain, and their pamphlet is titled, A Declaration and Remonstrance of the Distressed and Bleeding Frontier Inhabitants of the Province of Pennsylvania. A number of arguments and counter-arguments will then be published in pamphlet form, kind of going back and forth, including one from Benjamin Franklin, which I have quoted from, you know, here a couple minutes ago. Now, while this story shows the Paxton boys' attitudes towards the Native Americans among them. It doesn't stop there. We can't leave it just as a racial thing where it's, it's white against Indian. Scott Paul Gordon argues that the Paxton boys also targeted English Quakers and German Moravians when their behavior was such that the Paxton boys thought it was, you know, threatening and it jeopardized their frontier settlements because no matter how misguided they were, they did somehow in their heads think that they were just protecting their homes with this behavior. They were vigilantes, believing that they could use the violence to kind of shape the frontier into the image that they wanted it to be. And I should also mention that the Paxton boys, they were primarily Irish Presbyterians. Not, again, not trying to say all the Irish Presbyterians were, were lumped in with them, but it may help in understanding some of the cultural differences um, and, and why they thought that they, they could or should act. And this is where I'm going to leave you today, because next up we need to discuss the Augusta Boys a little bit further south and everything that happened in Virginia. Um, if you found this interesting, if you want to know more, please hit the like button below to help me out with the YouTube algorithms and hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet so that you manage to catch the rest of the story. Thanks. I'll see you next time.